Um, I'm sort of overexcited. You know how it is when you, you get to meet your heroes and your um, iconic people in, in the profession. Um, our next speaker, who is going to talk about Biker Wall in Newcastle, um, I've, I've known of, heard of, heard about since I was a student, one of you lot. And um, it's incredibly exciting. Those, those moments, this moment, when you're actually going to be listening to a living legend is something that will be with you. Um, and just so Jerry doesn't feel totally overwhelmed about being described like that, there are some other living le legends in the room, um, including Robert Holden, Hal Mogridge, Virginia Hinsa, etc., etc. So if you see somebody a bit, if you see somebody ancient and tottering around who's dribbling, go and talk to them because they are they are people who will be people you'll have heard of, people you may not have heard of, but certainly you'll have read about them in 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 literature. So Jerry is one of those, and he is a landscape architect. Um, originally started in um, Runcorn Development Corporation, then moved to Ralph Erskine um, Architects, who are the uh, architects for the bike development. Um, um, so those, that's really what we're, what we're going to hear about. And I was just chatting to Jerry before, and he's, he's currently doing quite a lot of work in Nigeria as well. But anyway, my pleasure to introduce. I'm using this slide, Ralph Erskine, um, more of him um, as, as we, we develop the talk. Ralph used this photograph when he gave his talk to the RIBA when he got his gold medal. So I thought if it's good enough for Ralph, it's good enough for me. So uh, that's a shot of Biker. Okay. Biker, it's a large housing estate in the east of Newcastle, built for Newcastle City Council as council housing. Um, you will see, we'll see in a bit more detail later, the bottom half of the, the, uh, the image is, is Biker, top half is Heaton. You're getting some of the industry of Walker coming in here. And then you've got the River Tyne uh, and, and the industry along the Tyne, uh, the bottom of the photograph. The layout um, was built for over 2,000 houses, uh, a mix of low, medium, high rise, or high-ish rise, uh, maisonettes and flats. Uh, see the courtyard type housing, type courtyard layouts. And then when we move on to the steeper slopes, we get into sort of more terraced forms and as it seems flatten out at the top again, back into courtyards. Kind of be interesting to talk about courtyards at a later date. There's good and bad things about them. The, the site itself is 200 acres. It's a sort of south facing amphitheater really that looks down the Tyne Valley. You can see the sort of city center beyond uh, the arch of the new footbridge. You see a bit of the roof of the Sage uh, Gallery in the distance. And here in the foreground and to the, the, the right hand side, you've got the, the wall itself snaking around. And again, we'll, we'll come to more of that later. So the question that I posed myself really when I was looking at this, it's kind of interesting to, to go back I went back to the place and had a good wander around. And uh, it's why was Biker at the time seen as having significance? And what, if anything, can it offer to the current debate where we're moving back to talk about larger scale housing developments? I mean, architecturally, it's very distinctive. It's been described as romantic functionalist, whatever that means. It's also been described as a dysfunctional hell, which I always thought was a little bit extreme. But what is true, that it was unusual for the time. So the late 60s, I mean, interestingly, when the uh, uh, previous speaker mentioned Gordon Cullen, Cullen and Ralph Erskine were sort of contemporaries, I think, at college. Um, and you know, all known to each other, and uh, you know, had quite a lot of respect for each other. And it's interestingly, there were sort of echoes of New Ash Green and some of the sort of thinking that that, that went into uh, into Biker. And um, I think what what we're seeing here, um, I mean, the, the late 
the late 60s, I mean, you had this sort of neo, a lot of schemes for sort of neo-brutalist really in persuasion. But Biker, whatever else it was, was undeniably colorful, lively, and friendly. The architecture, landscape design, and engineering were truly integrated. We really didn't draw, it was a small office, small design office, and it didn't really, so there were, there were no, no real distinctions. Obviously, you know, at certain points in time, you went off and did your own thing in terms of detailing, but the early thinking on projects, it was very much um, sort of group, group thought and a lot of debate in the office about what to do and how to do it. So it was a sort of a seamless process, really. And that, again, for the time, was unusual. Now, distinctive, though the, uh, the design was, and the process that created it was, that's not really the thing that makes Biker special. That came from a, a comment that Erskine made when he first visited Biker. He said, this place can be transformed and must be transformed without disrupting the social fabric. A biker had been a community since it was first sort of uh, mentioned around about 1100, but it actually goes back to that because it's about half a mile south of the Roman wall. It was a crossing point of sort of routeways and what have you. In the mid 1800s with the industrialization of Newcastle, cheap housing was sort of pushed into this area, it was near the river, it was near the industry on the river, and the, this was very much what you got, thousands of people living in these sort of conditions. No green space, no open space, no gardens. You know, this was, these were sort of just working communities. But what they did have <clears throat> was this strong, strong community. And it was called Brothers in Adversity, really. But, uh, Erskine recognized this. And he saw that this, this as he said, this vibrant functioning community must be retained. And he determined to put in place strategies, which were not design strategies, but strategies that would maintain that through this process. And given that within this sort of 200 acre plot, you were taking houses down and you were building new houses. So this was all happening cheek by jowl. There wasn't, you weren't moving people to another part of the country or anything like that. I mean, it was happening right on your doorstep. So that ballot, that's a really tr tricky, tricky thing to, um, to work with. The housing, some people actually said, and this is, uh, there's a Finnish, Finnish writer who felt that, uh, that Biker should be just restored. I mean, Biker was shot. Biker was poor, poor housing in the 1860s. You know, by the 1960s, it was a disaster. So the city wanted to do five demolition programs. Erskine said, you can't do that. We need at least 20 and probably more because this is going to be a difficult, difficult process for these people. In the end, the Grand British Compromise of 12 was arrived at. Um, so there were 12 demolition phases and 12 kind of new build phases, really, as it was the way it worked. There you can sort of see I mean, basically what was happening, you're moving people from the old housing, put them into the new housing and then taking down the old housing and then building some, you know, I mean, that, that, was, the, that, was, that was the process. <coughs> because of the sort of complications around all of this, he didn't want to produce a master plan. What he said was, we need a plan of intent. And that plan of intent will be endlessly flexible. It needs to be. We move things around, we move things uh, as we're sort of briefed by the community, uh, respond to sort of political pressures. Um, and as simply as we ourselves learn more about the job, we could sort of make the changes that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that were needed. 
He also placed an office in the middle of the site. This was the old undertaker's shop. Um, and that's where we worked. That was sort of the design office, the, the new bit on the back. Um, that was a really, a really strategic, uh, an important move. Because what it meant was that the people in Baika had direct access to you. They just used to come in through the door. And that is a real learning curve because you sort of, you very soon realize that decisions you're making on a drawing board are having a real impact on people's lives. And uh, there's interesting times in there, particularly when the pubs cleared out just, <laughs> just behind where we are. And I think it's worth remembering as well, as with New Ash Green, this was happening in the late 60s, when really across Britain, towns and cities were undergoing wholesale modernization. I mean, what was happening in Newcastle, that wasn't unusual. And the political mantra was comprehensive development. And Newcastle had, you know, it didn't avoid this. I mean, it, it had, uh, it was blessed actually with T. Dan Smith, we were determined to change Newcastle into the Venice of the North. I mean, Newcastle's hilly and it has no canals, <laughs> but you know, that was the sort of thing you were up against. And there was a, there was a comment actually, I was watching something on TV, using Billy Connolly was saying that people flocked from central Glasgow out to Drum Chapel on the promise of an inside bath. And as he said, you can only spend so much time in a bath. <laughs> and the, the point being that projects were going up that just didn't have the, the necessary bits and pieces you need to make, to build a family life. You know, I mean, there's the, 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 the some grim, grim stuff going on. I mean, just as a sort of little aside, when I worked in Runcorn, the, uh, the Herald of James Sterling built a, a scheme um, and to be honest, if somebody had chosen the wrong colour curtain on this thing, the whole design concept of this thing would have fallen apart. I mean, it was just so rigid. And interestingly, one of the project architects in Biker had worked on that scheme. And he said, Jim Sterling actually made him on this site, the flat site, made him work out the curvature of the earth across this site because he said, I want a flat site. <laughs> He genuinely believed in participation. And to deliver his plan of intent, many groups were sort of set up, they're both formal and informal. And to be honest, they persist to this day, a lot of the groups. Now, some of them had councillors on them, some of them had council officers on them, some were just purely resident groups, some were sort of groups of kids, some were interest groups. Uh, I mean, we had a, there was a, the biker festival group and that was sort of a fun thing we also did um, a design a park competition um, where residents got together i think we'd probably just run out of ideas actually needed a hand and uh, they set about designing a park in by the only park we have um, the one thing that we, uh, people said to us you cannot take people effectively off the street they will not understand scale they will not you know, it was the one thing nobody had a problem with was understanding scale you know they just there and the ideas were great we also did a thing called what to do with the old school yard which was um, a competition that actually ran out across the whole of newcastle uh, where the school kids redesigned their play areas the winning scheme was to get built the others all got books for the library and so on and so on. So all of this stuff was really, really important to Ralph um, in delivering his plan of intent. The other, uh, the other thing he was determined to, to do, a bit like the new Ash Green story, but it was green stuff that was being kept. The only thing that they were in Biker, there were certain build were key buildings, the pubs, the churches, the, the brick gable you can see in the middle of the photograph there, that's the swimming baths. Beyond that was the, the town laundry. And what used to happen there was, was a lady telling me, she said, um, 
you used to go to do your washing there and you paid so much to do your wash. But she said, I used to pay twice so I could stay there and chat to everybody else who was coming in. So I mean, it was a sort of a, you know, a real hub in the sort of community. So that was retained. It was actually built into the wall as some of the churches were. I mean, the wall actually kind of wraps its arms around them. Oop. This has stopped working. Oh, there you Oops. But the circulation system very straightforward and um, we used uh, some of the sort of the, the old landmarks that's the chimney on top of the laundry um, uh, just as sort of focal points uh, you know again it was just to sort of build on this um, the, uh, you know, the heritage of the place really now one of the other things that uh, was very important in this, and it kind of it goes back to a, a point that's, that's always stayed with me. If you can find the right starting point for a design, you might actually end up with the right solution. And Ralph used to go on about <coughs> these gossip groups. And what they were were just a bunch of the friends, a bunch of the family, whatever, in the old part of Biker. And we'd go around and sort of chat to them and see who in these groups wanted to live next door to each other. So you'd identify a whole group, then that would form some sort of a club or whatever. And they'd be talked through the designs of the houses, they would have some sort of say in colour schemes, they could go as a group and see their houses being built. It was a massive thing because it really, it meant that the, the established community just was established in the new biker. You know, it was the same, the same folk. So there was no kind of anti-feeling. It was an easy sort of transition. Um, and you know, really, really important. And then, well, this, this slide I, I put in there, because one of the things that we used to do, because you had the people that were moving to the houses and never had gardens. So we used to, as out of the sort of the landscape contract, we'd always put some money to start to one side and buy uh, plant selections so people could choose out of about four or five plant selections. So when they um, moved into the house, the contractor delivered, it was always on a weekend, sort of Saturday, a truckload of plants and people would come and take their selection pack away to the garden and they got literature with it to show how to work on with the plants and so on and so on and it was you know there were also and I'll show you in a later slide the encouragement always was because you're trying to build confidence in people really you know you wanted them to sort of be out of the house into the garden beyond the garden and so we used to say well look we're going to be landscaping beyond the fence in your garden Please feel free to stick in whatever you want in among our planting. All we ask you is don't take our stuff out. And to be fair, I mean, I'm not a horticulturist. There's nothing very clever about our planting schemes. This was um, an interesting one. It was a bowling green. And the assumption was that it was going to disappear with the development. It wasn't tremendously well used, but it was used. But we say, well, no. You know, we've, we've got a lot of courtyards. The courtyards tend to have different sort of themes or whatever. There's different art, art, things going. So, no, we want to keep the, the, the bowling green. And what we'll do, we'll put the old folks housing and sheltered housing schemes around it. So on a summer's evening, people can sit out on their balconies and cheer their team playing bowls. So the bowling green's there, still there, still well used. Um, this, I was going to go on to the biker officers group. This isn't the biker officers group, but the biker officers group was, this was another sort of key, key committee. And this was a, a joint committee between the design office and the city council officers. And it used to meet once a week in the initial stages of, of biker. And it was absolutely critical because some of the stuff we were doing was stretching the boundaries a bit, particularly around some of the engineering and road engineering. And we really needed to have a good relationship with the officers. They were great. Um, there was a chap, Doug Wood was the city engineer. He was 
excellent. He let his, we got away with murder, to be honest. And a, um, this all this is, this is us trying out various ideas for play areas. Uh, so we built some stuff outside the office. That's the office just behind. And um, just to see how the kids reacted to it and what, what went on. So all of that sort of stuff. So that really, those sort of structures, those processes were setting the scene for us as the design team to then go and do our thing. The wall. Anybody who knows a biker tends to know about the wall. It served various sort of purposes. The, the intention was that there would be a motorway just to the left-hand side of the wall, so it's going to generate a lot of noise. So the north side of biker, so the wind used to sort of come whipping in. Uh, so Ralph really wanted to sort of identify this, this community, and he just felt by building this wall around it, it really announced <coughs> that this is, this is biker. It's only one flat thick. It's not a, it's not a it's high enough, but it's not, not a particularly wide building. And the bathrooms, kitchens, red boxes, the sort of air vents, they were on the north side. Car parking, car ownership in Biker was very, very low. And we put all of the car parking on the outside of the wall. It's causing problems now, I know, but it's, it's been looked at. Um, where the, you may see on some of the photographs there's just sort of grass areas on the outside of the wall because we hadn't, we hadn't a clue how many cars to, to, to allow for. Um, so there's grass areas that could be converted into car parking at a later stage. So it was, it was kind of flexible. Where you're approaching the wall from the north, just to sort of help people get orientated, the Brickwork designs intensify at the entry point, so you can sort of see where you're going from a distance. Uh, car drop off, car points that people just you see you walk through. On the other side of the wall, very very different. This is the south side, and the the uh, the walkway is a communal walkway going through the middle. Above and below, you've got the private balcony, so everybody had. A balcony, they were looking south, they were looking at the Tyne, they were looking at Newcastle Centre. I mean, the views are fabulous from up there. And looking over <clears throat> Biker itself. This of you up on, the, on this main walkway, <clears throat> everybody got a seat outside and a planting box. You know, you couldn't have a garden because you're up in the sky, but you will, you will have that. The point there being, I guess, all the time, the detailing was working to try and encourage contact, uh, communication. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's impossible to walk along there if somebody's sitting on their chair and not at least say hello, you know. And then it, it, it sometimes you go from the office to do something or to see somebody or whatever, you know, something had happened. And you'd be away for ages because folk used to sit out and go, oh, do you like a cup of tea? Yes, go. <laughs> and it was just, <laughs> so it, it you know, to be honest, you used to avoid going along there. <laughs> Private balconies, the views, super, you know. I think we, we actually sort of, there's a lot of people got into astronomy, I was told, in Biker, because the, uh, the night sky from, uh, from various points on the wall. The wall itself was old, older people, elderly people on the upper floors, families on the ground floor. And again, the point being that when you're up three or four floors, you're looking down and you see the kids making a noise, running around. Isn't that wonderful? You go down on the ground floor and you see the kids running around making a noise. It's terrifying and you lock your door. So, you know, people used to love watching the kids playing from up there, but definitely not from from ground level. Families on the ground level, it was their kids that were making the noise. Where main walkways uh, underneath some of the higher parts of the wall, I mean, it was a bit intimidating having this sort of structure above you. So we used to sort of run pergolas around the place uh, with uh, climbing plants on them. But to be honest, any excuse to have a bit of timber detailing somewhere. 
Uh, the other sort of housing house type, the link blocks, they kind of plugged into the wall. Um, again, same sort of trick, families below, flats and maisonettes above. Uh, and the, there was this sort of walkway, that elevated walkway that went around the place as well as uh, down. We'll come to roads later, but that's one of the sort of the one of the main uh, carriageways through Biker. Footpaths, pretty scruffy photograph, but um, it shows the we, old Biker. Everything went up and down the hill, so we poke in Biker had legs like mountain goats, but we flicked everything to run along the contours and it just made life a lot easier for sort of getting around. So that, that was a big shift in the type of layout that, that, that we did. Just at the end there, you probably can't make it out too well, but it's what, what we call the stilt blocks, where there were sort of um, apartments above and we just didn't build anything down below. So you could, you could kind of block off a view of sealer space that people could still filter through underneath. I strongly suspect we wouldn't do that again. Uh, they, you know, in this current day and age, not too bad, but you get problems down there. You know, kids hanging about and, and so on. Courtyard, the bulk of the, the housing was in courtyards. The, we used a lot, a lot of flowering stuff, flowering trees, roses, anything with a flower, basically that we could sort of buy cheap. Because the other thing was, everybody thought Biker got more money um, uh, for the development. It didn't. I mean, it was, you know, I can't remember what sort of cost yardstick stuff, but I mean, it was just standard budgets, but you just had to sort of uh, manipulate them uh, differently. We had, um, we managed to get some land from the city council. Um, and what we used to do was, buy cheaply from the um, nurserymen at the end of the season when they were going to be plowing the stuff back into the ground and we said look can we just sort of buy a few truckloads of plants we'd plant them out ourselves and grow them on so um you know we got some mature hedging and you know even sort of up to getting on for sort of semi-mature sized trees by doing those sort of things so it was um you know anything to make the thing work really when we got onto the the slopes, uh, we changed the sort of style of the the housing uh, and the detailing. I don't quite know what I mean. Perfectly reasonable thing to do, um, and it was split level housing, so the living accommodation was upstairs. So they got a view over the, the roof on the lower side. So again, you, you maintain those views down the uh, down the Tyne Valley, and beloved of the architectural review that uh, that gable elevation actually the, the project architect of this is a very very well-known architect in london now i'll not, I'll not say his name but uh, he um i worked with him on this one and uh, he produced these very crisp elevations but he couldn't resist sticking a bird box up on the top <laughs> you know because he was a he was very much a sort of city boy, um, but it, the Erskine thing was getting to him. And when I saw that, actually, it reminded me of, uh, there was a, a quote, if I can find it in here, of uh, from Raina Bannum uh, in uh, New Society. And uh, he, he said, Erskine is outstandingly the most messy architect practicing in Europe today. Biker raises the style to such heroic heights of apparent inattention, you're surprised half of it doesn't fall off. So it was, I think, in our defense, most of the detail, not all of it, but most of the detailing had a definite function. And very little was actually added just simply for, for, for decoration. One of the things that we did do was, uh, in terms of the now sort of getting into sort of the straight landscape stuff, I suppose, was we defined external space very, very clearly. There was public space, there was semi-private space, and there was private space. And the, the kind of 
junctions um, uh, and the transition points between those changes were detailed in sort of specific ways. So this photograph's been taken from uh, a main kind of drag through the town. You look down, you know, it's still a public area, but you're wanting people just to sort of calm down and quieten down a wee bit. So you're trying to do something to the sort of subconscious. You know, so just the simple device of a, a simple timber thing spanning between the, the, the two houses, you're playing with the footpath, you're adding paving in. And what you can't see on this, um granite cobbles we used to sort of pinch those from the old streets and just reuse them uh, granite curbs so there'd be there'd be a bunch of details around that just to sort of try and and, and calm down and, and bring the scale in as well when you entered the courtyard you actually went through a gate i mean this is a fairly open one some of them were more more closed but you know you so you you're then entering somebody else's space it belongs to the group of people around that courtyard so again you know you're hoping that people sort of start to behave differently and there's nothing to stop the public going through there but you're kind of trying to dissuade them and then the, that same courtyard uh, you go into the garden space there you've got your uh, your fence and so on and so on the reason i put that in it just it's a good illustration of people taking over the area um, and putting their own stuff in there. It was good when you, when you saw that, it was great because you knew you were starting to win. <laughs> you know, you just, um, and it, it was always a real positive thing with us that. This is another uh, entrance to, this is up on the, um, the, the, the slope where we have those terrace housing. Again, the footpath running between the, the terraces. This is the district heating system flying through in this, uh, this timber duct. So we use that as part of the gateway and just sort of added to that, that structure to create a gate down at the lower, the, the lower level. Public spaces near the wall, that, that was very simply, um, totally the wrong species of trees. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but uh, the, uh, there is a sort of a scale that suits the wall, and you know we 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 didn't do uh, we didn't do a great deal with those. People made of them what they would. Oops. And the wall itself is in two parts the the south the southern section around dun terrace area it kind of ends in a flourish that's the and that's all old person's housing sheltered housing down below um again we use pretty substantial trees and there's quite a lot of garden space down at the bottom of that to um you know just give it a sort of a human scale down at the lower level Beach hedging. We use a lot, a lot of beach hedging. And then the reason for that was there was um, some of the early meetings. There was a perception in the people in Biker that if you went to Jesmond or you went to Gosforth, which were seen as middle class areas, they all had beach hedges. So they said, "We want beach hedges." So, grand. so there's a lot of beach hedging in Biker. Um, and again, the point being, we. We'll see on a, a bit later slide. We used to have a garden, a fence, a hedge beyond the fence, so that we could control the cutting of that. But equally, people in the house, if they wanted the hedge higher, they just needed to say, and it would be left to grow. And that so they could increase their own privacy um, with that. And there, there you sort of see it. Just probably I don't know why. That, what's happened to the hedge there it's been taken, <laughs> taken down for whatever but again we talk about maintenance and management um you can see we used to sort of refer to the the stuff that we were doing really as a kit of parts i mean just interesting you were talking about uh detailing for um because i've got all of the standard details for biker so if, if that's any use to the uh you know you know, I'll get to, I'll get you those because we needed because we were a small office. Um, the 
you know, and, uh, you know, and you're housing nine and a half thousand people. You had to have a kind of a shorthand to how to deliver these schemes. So, I mean, we would have had, I don't know, six or eight different privacy screen details and they were just given a code. So on the drawing, you know, once you'd fix the layout and all of that sort of stuff, you could rattle around that drawing, just going, that's a 1A there, a 2C there, a, you know, whatever, whatever. And the contractors, that's all they reacted to. So we didn't get involved in drawing out uh, much at all. You know, you, you had to find a fast way of working because for several years, I was the only landscape architect and biker. Pegas Starson was there when I started. And Per and I worked together for a while. Then he went off on his kind of academic career. Um, and then there was myself working with two students. There was Anne-Sophie, student came over from Sweden. And another guy, uh, Keith Brumpton, uh, an English guy, and we were the, the landscape team. You know, that was it. Um, and you're knocking out a lot of work. So you're doing all of the... Because the houses themselves are a basic, very simple sort of box. Something wildly clever about them. And it's all of the entertainment that's nailed on and sort of surrounds it and, and all the rest of it. And that was, the, that was the work of the landscape architect, to do that. Um, and so as I say, you had to then devise ways when you could you, you, you could actually uh, perform. Um, fences, again, money was tight. So I mean, the fences were you know the, the sort of minimum height on the fence, a bit of a kick rail there to stop the, uh, the damage to the. Um, right, but all of those bits and pieces kind of built up a visual richness, um, and and the and the use of the colour that was. Oops. It was important. There you sort of see somebody has to their hedge be let grow, so they get complete sort of privacy behind. The granite curbs are serving. Um, these are sort of free issue, if you like. So that was a big help to us because uh, as they were pulling up the old streets in Biker, we were reclaiming all of the, the curbs and the, the cobbles. This stuff... <laughs> Yeah, we were forever trying to find ways to sort of reduce the scale of the, the routeways, the walkways. When we ran out of sort of the, the granite sets, we resorted to the, 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 you know, the concrete, whatever they call it, I can't even remember the name of the stuff now, um, where the grass is supposed to grow through, but it never does. Um, grass creek, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. I mean, the early stuff, you used to sort of burn out the plastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, horrible. Uh, yeah, so there, that hedge is working nicely, very, very simple, nice little sort of elevation down Spires Lane. So there's a church at the end built into the wall behind the photographer. There's another church, um, very popular part of the, uh, the estate to, uh, to live in. That's one of the roadways. Again, we just did everything we could to make a road not look like a road. Uh, because the whole point of biker was car ownership was low. So why would you pander to you know, the few car owners that there are? It's a place for families. You want kids running around. Um, I mean, I had, I used a lot of the thing, it's a bit of a diversion this, but we've got time, I think. I did, I did, um, the last project I did before I sort of retired, was uh, the master planning for um, a project called the Staithes on the time. It was Wayne Hemingway, got a lot of press about it. He raised it through Taylor Wimpy. And I did this sort of ex the external work strategy and it then became taken over as a home zone. It was never designed as a home zone. We never heard of home zones, but anyway, the government latched onto it, it became a home zone project. And we had, there was a, a meeting where I had to meet with police, the ambulances and the fire service. And they said, we will not accept this road layout that you've, you've produced uh, because we cannot meet our response times. So I said, well, that's tough because that's what we're gonna do and we're not changing it. So the fireman said, ah, so he said, so you're gonna take responsibility for the old lady who dies in the house fire down there because we can't get to the, the 
I was quickly enough. So I said, yeah, I will. As long as you'll take responsibility for wiping the kids out as you're flying down the road and they're out on the sort of their little bikes, you know, what do we do? So in the end, we got our way. But I mean, the discussions around trying to play with highway schemes get pretty heavy, you know, they really do. But you have to stick to your guns. And again, I go back to an engineer called Eddie Jenkins who worked at Runcorn. And Eddie was very responsible for the, the Cheshire Design Guide. Um, Eddie's view of highway engineering was that if you can prove to me it works, then I'll build it. So if I can put a center line down it, I can build that bloody road, you know, so that was it. So he, and it's when you, you come across characters like that in your work in life that have such a massive impact on the way you go about your own stuff, you know, and uh, there, another sort of road, example of a road. So we play with the layouts to sort of interrupt the, the views of the roads, um, you know, and put stripes across and whatever, whatever, just to sort of slow everything down. Be meeting places, Wherever we could, I, I was a real fan of uh, seats and tables because I personally believe there's as much play potential in that as there is a play area because the kids used to sort of hang about on them, hang underneath them, sit and draw, you know, and not everybody wants to kick a football. And so th this sort of thing happened everywhere. Um, and... Uh, they were well used and it, the biggest state and it's quite a hike over to the shops on Shields Road. So by the time you got back to the wall, you know, you needed to sit down if you're sort of looking a whole load of stuff. Um, and you'd always see somebody passing who you knew. So it was an opportunity for people to meet without going through the rigmarole of going to somebody's house and sort of seeing them and all of that. So it was all of this informal contact. It was a, it was a massive part of the, the scheme. Little shelters we used to sort of build in the courtyards. Um, there's another version just on a sort of a main uh, one of the main drags just somewhere there'll always be a sort of a tree stuck in the middle of the box and, and, and away you go really there was a point and it was maybe following the sort of the, the Rainer Bannum comment about messy architecture we started to question a wee bit whether we were go really getting over the top with the detailing. Was there just too much going on? Um, and Michael Brown, the architect in London, he, he was up. And he said, what you've got to do is put yourself in the shoes of an elderly person. And they move through a scheme at a certain pace small child, somebody pushing prams, somebody lugging a load of bags. They will always tend to use the same route to wherever they're going. It's not like visiting architects who buzz around the whole sort of scheme. You know, they do that. So he said, for that person, you can't, you, the more you can do to visually stimulate, the, you know, the better. So with his endorsement ringing in our ears, we got back at it. <laughs> we used to sort of pinch bits of, I mean, it was like an industry with us. Uh, whenever there was a building coming down, somebody would ring us, oh, such and such is coming down. Oh, great, you know, and we'd go out. And usually at night, um, there was a Swiss, <laughs> a Swiss architect we had who was fearless. I mean, he would go up to the top of buildings. We've had weather vanes taken off and, drop down through the roof and all the rest of it. And we, we used to just build them in. I mean, that's a bit of the old town hall in Newcastle. Um, there was a guy on site came up to me one day, and a JCB driver, and he said, I've just seen a school being pulled down on my way to work today. He said, there's a lovely date stone, great big one. It said 1870 something on it, beautiful sort of script. Said, uh, do you want me to go get it? You know, I said, oh, my grand, you know. So off he went with the JCB, came back with this thing. And I said, well, we we'll find somewhere to build it in, you know. So it is built into a, a wall now. And they just used to appear on the drawings as ruined bits. <laughs> and 
<laughs> the planters used to used to drive them nuts. He said, oh, it's growing bit. You know what's it? I said, we haven't a clue. We haven't found it yet. But it, it'll get built in. And this, this was almost very embarrassing because I got a call from a, a depot one day and um, they said, look, we've got some old iron work in the corner of the depot. Come and have a look at it. If it's any good to you, you can have it. It's grand. So we went down and said, yeah, it looks, looks good. You know, it's sort of a heap of stuff. So we brought it back. We got it shot, blasted, painted up, built it in. And I got a call from the guy and he said, oh, he said, uh, have you still got that iron work? I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, oh, well, we need it back. And I said, <laughs> Too late, bunny lad. <laughs> it's built in. He said, oh, man. He said, the city council have just got a grant to restore St. Mary's well. And he said, that's the original ironwork from the late 1600s. And he said, we've got to have I said, you've got no chance. I said, I'll say now to, if you say now. So it was about a couple of months ago, I was on the site with one of the planners and, uh, from the city, and I, I took a pass. I said, you know what that is? So that's your gateway to St. Mary's well. <laughs> well. It's been there a good few years now, she said. I said, well, I'm, uh, she said, well, I'm retiring soon, so I'll say now. <laughs> Trees. We overplanted trees because we thought the kids would damage them, so we would lose a percentage. We thought there'd be natural dieback. Um, we just, and anyway, we wanted a very soft green scheme, so we were going to sort of horse the sort of tree. Of course, the kids never touched the trees, they did die. We'd said to the city council, look, we what we want to do is, can you please regard maintenance and management as a design exercise, not a chore? You know, we're designing with design exercise at the start. We're designing when it's just bare ground. You're going to be designing with stuff that exists. That's fun, you know? So after sort of five years, we want you to thin these trees out. After 10 years, take some more out, you know, and so on. So, on. so the guys that we were talking to were fine about all of that. Problem was the unions were structured in such a way that they were worked on a, something like a three-year cycle and there were certain things they wouldn't do, certain things attracted bonus, certain things didn't, you know, and it just was an absolute, so it never happened. So now there's a big problem in Biker because there are just too many trees. And the problem is getting in at them to get the buggers out, you know? And I've been a bit involved. I mean, I'm, I'm thankfully not involved on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, the, uh, you know, just folk asked me what my view was, you know? And uh, I said, well, you know, they've just got to, you've got to go, you know, you've got to get rid of a lot of stuff. Um, so that, that's been looked at at the moment. And I mean, interestingly, uh, the, the scheme passed from city council control to the Biker Housing Trust, and it's now just recently passed to Carbon Homes, who are a social housing provider. So they've taken over the whole scheme. Um, we've had a meeting with them, and I said, "Look, you know, this is now this the scheme is now listed uh, by English Heritage. It's you know you're taking this thing on. You saw it as a big prize." But with the prize that, that comes, you know, you've got to put some effort in and you're going to have to go back to what we said right at the outset, that you can't manage these sort of schemes on this basis. We actually built a depot on Biker for a small team to, to work. So those guys would literally do the work on the, the, the housing. If a bit of guttering fell off or a gate fell off or hedges needed trimming or whatever, there would just be a team of people who just did that. And when you're talking about a population of around 10,000, surely, you know, that's not an unreasonable thing to have a sort of small dedicated team. The city would never do it. Carbon are going to do it, apparently. I, uh, I know uh, one of the contractors that we used to work with, he retired. He's still sort of very fit guy so I said to him I said look you, you, you fancy doing a bit of you know two or three days a week on something said, yeah, yeah so I said well look could you just organize some guys and, and get a team together and uh, so Carbon I think are taking him on and that will actually happen all these years later. Blossom we love Blossom 
any, any excuse to sort of stick blossom trees. That's outside the school. Um, and there, <laughs> actually, uh, Robert would know. When I, when I was at uh, Newcastle, one of the uh, lecturers, Ken Hale, asked me if I was colour blind. <laughs> because I was, he's probably right, actually. I just love strong colour and I love flower. You know, I don't often know what they are, but, you know, you kind of use them like kind of architectural elements, like built elements, you know. And uh, so we did loads of this. Unfortunately, a lot of it now has gone and but we're looking to sort of hopefully get it all sort of reinstated because we wanted to choose plants that were familiar to people even though they didn't have gardens they all knew what roses were they all knew what flowering cherries were you know so you just pick the sort of species that people would understand and could could relate to and therefore not sort of damage and to be fair we've got very little vandalism or damage on bike i was down there a few months ago, I sort of wandered around. I was really disappointed at the amount of litter that there was about. And I kind of, I was annoyed with myself afterwards because I thought, you buggers, you know, you're so in sort of litter down like this. And I got chatting to a couple of women coming down the road and I said, yeah, what's the crack with all the litter? I said, it's the bin men. It's not the kids. When the bin men come through here, you wouldn't believe the mess they leave behind. So this is the city creating the problem, you know? And these folk, bless them, used to go out with bags after the bin men had gone, tidying up, you know? So, you know, we've had some strong words with the, uh, with, with, with the city about this. And, um, you know, so there's a whole strategy now around sort of litter and so on and so on. So uh, kind of in conclusion, really, I made the point at the start of the talk about was biker relevant? Why was it special? Was it, is it relevant now? I think sort of aspects of it are. I mean, I certainly use things that I learned working here on schemes that I've worked with, 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 with recently. And, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of foist this sort of style or, you know, make any sort of special claims for it. But I think what is, important from working with sort of a skin was <coughs> he, he had his checklist and it was sort of a checklist that he used on all projects that he worked on and I think the the legacy that biker I think can offer people working on schemes that you may be working on now or you know, students to sort of work on it in the future. His checklist was, does the work fulfill all reasonable everyday needs and some unreasonable ones? Does it form a step on the way to some better human community in which we could believe? Does it encourage group contacts and can it also give privacy? Can it inspire those who may live there to participate in the task of giving it form? Does it form a meaningful part of and beautify the community and the landscape in which it stands? <clears throat> Does it open possibilities for future generations to adapt it to their needs? Are all the solutions the best possible? And does it create satisfying work for those who build? And can it, as all creative art can, both disturb and give new and unexpected pleasure? Will the work mature with age and dignity? And does it give joy? And is it beautiful and full of charm? That's it. Thank you. Well, that's that's brilliant. The <clears throat> the word I was going to um, say thank you with was uh, that was completely joyous. <laughs> so perfect. Um, one or two questions, maybe before lunch.
Oh. I think you said you were going to say something special about courtyards. It's about, sorry? About courtyards. Yeah. So you didn't actually... No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I... On the face of it, you know what I mean? Ralph had this thing and he always saw the best in people. So he, you know, everybody in the courtyard would be lovely and they'd all get on and all the rest of it. Now, it started to become an issue when the city council, seeing that Biker was this settled community and was going fine. They had problem families elsewhere in the city. Oh, well, we'll move them into Biker because the Biker folk will turn them into decent human beings. Of course, it doesn't happen. And if you put somebody like that in a courtyard, the number of interactions around a courtyard are entirely different to a terrace. You know, if you're an awkward character on a terrace, it's the people on either side of you that suffer. But in a courtyard, you know, because I went into one of the courtyards one day, and I mean, it was looking a bit disheveled. And you know, the people used to look after these courtyards themselves. I said, what else going on? And the bloke said, oh, we, we don't use the courtyard now. We just go out the front door and away. And so why is that? You know, them over there, you know? And so some of the, some of the layouts, you know, I mean, I think it, it just really needs thinking about, you know, when, you, when uh, you're doing these, these city schemes, um, some layouts can work brilliantly well, um, but you know, whether it's through management or something, which is something to be aware of, it can be an issue. Um, and some of the smaller courts work better than some of the bigger courts, you know what I mean? I guess it was just... They, you know, do they have ins and outs or are they just one in and out? There'd be two, 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 two sort of gateways, but it was... It's just the way they were sort of organised, you know, every, yeah, because, because we were encouraging everybody to sort of go into the courtyard and do their own thing and, you know, and group things and all the rest of it. You really, you know, it, it could poison an atmosphere. Um, and I mean, it's a tricky area, Biker. It's not, you know, the, there are some, some difficult characters around there and they, 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 they like to make their presence felt. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was just something uh, we've, we've talked about, and the group of us have sort of talked about. I, I don't know whether, you know, there must be some maths around it that you can work out, the, you know, the whole sort of number of, uh, you know, potential sort of interactions. But it was, it was just that, you know, we've, we've had problems in some of the courtyards. Um, you seem to be doing a lot more than the average person in the commission. So, how did you reconcile your appointments with the quantity of work you're doing beyond doing a landscape scheme? Because you seem to be part sociologists or community workers, etc. It's not your average commission. No, and you're kind of buying into that because of that that list right at the start, the plan of intent. You know, the, the this is going to be. You know, if you didn't fancy it, go work somewhere else. You know, you. It, I mean, the Swedes when they came over, they actually lived in Biker. They rented houses in the old part of Biker. So they were very much part of the community. Um, so you, you were living it 24 hours a day. Um, it was worth it for the, um, just for the experience of it, to be honest. You know, it, it's, um, it, there's lessons from it I've used everywhere I've worked. I've worked a lot in Africa. I worked in China, I worked in the Caribbean. And the one thing that you, you realise, people are the same, <laughs> no matter where you go, you know, it's the same issues. And it's the same sort of tricks, if you like, that you, you picked up here, or there's the same lessons you learned, you, you use in different ways in different places, you know. But I mean, uh, the underlying thing is, you've really got to find out, as I say, this, what is the right starting point to uh, to a project, mm. uh, and there's been some weird ones. I mean, I can think of one in particular in Nigeria, which was a strange one. Uh, yeah, we were we were um, uh, build, we were rebuilding a football stadium actually in the worst part of Port Harcourt at the height of the kidnappings, and the the starting point there was that well, if this contract's going to work, we've got to tackle this head on because you know otherwise we're going to get kidnapped or worse so we actually sort of spent a lot of time 
finding out who the lads were that were doing the kidnapping. And we sort of eventually managed to sit down with them. And uh, the, the chief kidnapper, who uh, was an absolute nutcase. But you could reason with the bloke. And uh, we said, look, you can supply labor to the site and you can supply materials to the site. Um, but, you know, we don't want any nonsense. He said, no, you'll be fine. You won't have any problems. And that contract just went like a dream. It really did. You know, and other contracts were, were moving. Um, and, you know, um, it, without him, and without spending the time to find that guy and try and reason, see if you could reason, you couldn't have done that job. It was a non-starter, you know. So it always comes back to individuals, people, you know, whatever, whatever. They're always, you know. Um, you may have said it at the beginning, but um, who were you employed by? Because it sounds like you're working right from the design right through to the construction. Is that right? Yes. So yeah. who were you working for or with, or how did that work? Um, well, Erskine's were the... Ralph Erskine was the, the designer, and I worked for Ralph Erskine. Um, so the client was the city council, um, and then we worked with the biker officers group very closely. Um, and so then we were responsible for all design and supervision on site. And we worked with two or three contractors and we got to know the contract as well. So it became like a kind of design and build situation. You know, you could, you could then get away with shorthand drawings, knowing that they weren't going to whack a claim in or something like that. You know, I mean, it was, it was again, just sort of building those sort of relationships were really important. Yeah. Can we just have one, actually? We'll have over. Well, mine's a very mundane question. I wondered, with, with all the coloured timber cladding, has that or does it cause a lot of maintenance problems? Do you know, the timber is the one thing that's really worked. <laughs> I, was, I was just saying before, the brickwork, faces of blown off bricks, um, the concrete, I mean, it's on boulder clay, so getting those sort of steps that they had to be sort of set on concrete. They've moved, you know, there's, there's been all sorts of issues. We were told on day one, those timber details will never work, you know, small section timber. It's the one thing we haven't had a problem with. And the, the, the other thing about it is, particularly when you get up onto the slopes, we managed to design out a lot of retaining wall, um, so what we did, we just had lots of small changes in level through the garden and, and then kind of graded the, the, the slope off down to the, the main footpath and just made sets of steps off site in timber and just dropped them in clear of the ground. They're still there. It, 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 honestly, the timber has been great. And we use the timber, we use rough sawn timber. And the, the reason for that was that we wanted to encourage people to to add stuff, you know, to hang things and all the rest of it. If we'd use engineered timber, it's a bit intimidating, but rough sawn timber, nobody manages, you know, everybody hacks about with it, you know, that's not a problem. And it also takes the stain better. So we didn't use paint, but weirdly, for some reason, the city council, when they took over the skin, they started painting everything. Well, the paint is a, it's a nightmare, but I mean, stain is so easy to put on. It's just like putting water on, you know, you just lash it on. Um, and it's a part preservative as well. So the, um, no, the timber stain, no problem. Do you, do you think that use of this really human user-friendly material had some influence on the success of those walkways? Because thinking of something like the Hume Estate in Manchester, which was all pre-cost contract, uh, yeah. concrete, it's a complete and utter disaster. Yeah, I think it, it says a lot, to be honest, for soft landscaping. I mean, we just really believed in planting and we just whacked it in. I wasn't bothered what it was, you know, as long as it grew, you know, and we just sort of horsed stuff in and people reacted really well to that, you know, and it just has that sort of humanising effect, you know, I mean, massive impact, really. Um, and in the most unlikely sort of uh, place, I mean, now... Um, landscape architect Philip Barker he's doing the kind of the, the revamp he's introducing wildflower and all sorts of stuff now um, and no it it, um, it won I think the sort of the, the fiddling around that we used to do because it was easy to do that because of the way we had the details all set up coded you could mess around with sort of changes in level and different materials and you could do it very quickly 
Um, and once you once you got it into your head, you were sort of flying through the drawings, you know, just coding them up. Um, and uh, and then the, the people on site, yeah, they were they were fine with it, you know. So the more I mean, it goes back to sort of uh, Michael Brown's point, you know, the more visual stimulation that you can get into a skin, you know, and you just have to trust people that they'll they'll go with it, you know. But if you give them something brutal and hard, and I mean, like so much of the stuff in the 60s was, you know, it's no wonder people sort of do what they do, you know. I guess stop there and um, thank you again. Yeah. Fantastic.